All right, welcome to our presentation. Um, thank you for attending our IGF 2022 presentation. Um, me and my co-speaker, Lauren, will talk We'll be talking about how to mobilize youth to combat mistis and malinformation in civil society. And my name is Amelia Panikam. I'm currently a freshman at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I study computer science. And Thank then... you. Thanks, Amelia. And we're really delighted to be here for this important effort. My name is Lauren Buita. I'm the founder and CEO of Girl Security. Oh, whoops. <laughs> um, so, essentially, with our time here, um, sorry for starting a little bit late, but with our time, 20 minutes, we're going to provide some, ident or identify some best working practices to kind of combat MDM, and we're going to discuss the security implications of MDM, highlight gender disinformation, and really identify the role of women and youth in this space. So just briefly, Girl Security is a nonprofit organization that works with girls, women, and gender minorities in middle to late adolescence. Uh, our mission is twofold. It's to empower girls and gender minorities to understand security decision-making, which is most often led by men and has gendered implications. A secondary goal is to also provide pathways for those girls and women who seek to pursue careers within the security sector, which may include government, international institutions, um, as well as industry and civil society. Uh, currently, we have about 800 mentees and over 5,000 program participants, both within the United States and globally. As most of you probably know uh, from watching the way disinformation has impacted certainly the United States and its elections, uh, disinformation will have different impacts depending upon local communities. Um, the goal of disinformation is really designed to weaponize narratives that oftentimes focus on marginalized communities, which can include people of color, it can include girls and women, it can include uh, populations uh, as well as gender minorities. Uh, the impact of disinformation, and I would say mis, dis, and malinformation, um, is really designed to create distrust among the public in government as well as other trusted sources. Um, one of the most, I think, prominent challenges that we confront is what we call the post-truth era and providing individuals across the world with the tools that they can use and employ in their everyday lives to better understand both what mis, dis, and malinformation is, what it's designed to do, and how individual identity-based narratives are being weaponized. So, you ahead, Lauren. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, at Girl Security, we also recognize that many security threats have gendered impacts, as I earlier noted. Um, certainly youth and girls are on the front lines of mis, dis, and malinformation and related security threats in the digital domain. One of the biggest advocacy areas for girl security especially is that we're watching our digital world be designed very much like our physical world, where the threats of girls and women are being marginalized and deprioritized. Uh, just statistically speaking, there's uh, several excellent reports, but I would point people to Plan International's report. Girls and women are more likely to be targeted by misinformation. And again, misinformation is often coupled online with online violence. So that can be online harassment, it can be doxing, it can be deep fakes that weaponize um, explicit imagery of teen girls as well. Um, in addition, as uh, most statistics bear out, youth are the primary users of social media and also rely primarily on social media for their news information. Um, so youth are both sort of a targeted population in the MDM space, but also an undervalued resource in advancing intergenerational initiatives, which is what Girl Security prioritizes. Uh, bringing those voices to the foreground of new thinking on how to combat this threat. Um, and over to you, Amelia, to add to this. So something I wanted to bring up was how important youth are in the space. And I think it's especially important to include them because there's this pretty misconception, there's a pretty common misconception in which that since youth were born into this influx of the digital realm, that they know how to navigate 
know, they know how to navigate it. And this is um, this is false. This is not true. We we struggle with the same things when it comes to identifying news and information and processing all this. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And it's really important that in creating policy and creating methods to kind of you know involve youth and to combat MDM, it's really important to hear these youth perspectives and these gendered perspectives just in order just to create a better and more inclusive policy framework. We wanted to flag here uh, what we call the National Girl Security Strategy, which was about a hundred page uh, document drafted by girl security fellows. So these are all adolescent girls and women and gender minorities who addressed um, some of our world's most pressing security challenges. Uh, climate change, of course, being one, domestic terrorism, human trafficking. But the one of import for this conversation was actually led by Amulia and her team. Um, these, she created a series of recommendations about how youth can be involved more fundamentally and wholly in government and industry efforts. These recommendations were provided to government officials um, as well as briefed um, uh, to government officials on the recommendations. But Amulia, I'm sure you can point out some more, um, the highlights of, of your recommendations as well. So when we were drafting this memo, like my team and I really sat down together and kind of identified some of the most pressing issues facing us and how we think as youth, we can kind of better combat this issue. And one of those was media literacy efforts and kind of through education, you know, making sure generations are more digitally aware and have the digital literacy to kind of navigate the internet and hopefully create a less fragmented internet in the future. So we think that media literacy um, efforts is one of the key ways to kind of really involve youth and kind of mobilize youth because it gives youth the skills that they need in order to be a successful um, digital native. So from Girl Security's perspective, I think it's important to note that disinformation will look very differently for different populations, both within the United States, but globally. And we've created learning content uh, for both the United States populations as well as global populations. I think it's first important to note that um, and perhaps at the outset, we should have noted that mis and disinformation are oftentimes designed to deceive, and certainly for disinformation, it is designed to activate violence and anger and sow discord among populations. It is also designed, especially for gendered types of disinformation, to sow vulnerability and fear. At Girl Security, we find that community-based efforts led what we refer to as identity centered so led by the communities most impacted are most effective so it's activating those networks at the community level and creating measurable pathways for those communities to create different whether it's learning outcomes advocacy outcomes that can be briefed again to key stakeholders whether policy leaders business or industry civil society faith-based organizations community-based organizations as well um, and then amplifying youth solutions. And again, even just um, creating space for youth, uh, which I think is excellent as part of this forum is one way that we can begin doing that. Uh, we've seen in our work how novel and how activated youth become so organically uh, when they perceive threats to their security with disinformation again on social media being one. Um, and certainly using social media is one way to activate public awareness, but, but also there are other ways to activate public awareness of youth solutions, which again include um, uh, leveraging professional networks, leveraging government education networks to amplify those solutions as well. And then I think one of the things that we've seen to be most effective in our work is building relationships with other organizations that are tackling other aspects of digital literacy, of gendered violence, um, of threats to security. Uh, we're still at a point in this conversation where I think we recognize that disinformation is a challenge um, and we recognize the role of media and digital literacy, but we haven't yet come up with, I think, um, a series of scalable pilot projects or solutions beginning and led by youth. And that is something that we are certainly committed to as well. And so certainly for uh, the role of government, I think oftentimes, or at least the conversation that we have at Girl Security is that government cannot do everything. 
uh, when a young person is confronted with MDM online, they are alone. Um, they may be with friends, you know, they may be sharing or resharing mis and dis malinformation, but they are alone. And so it is really crucial to, again, seed efforts that can be spread either organically or through activated nodes to young people so that they are empowered online and that they're in control of their narrative, which I think is one of the most important things. You know, disinformation can quiet girls and women. It can suppress their civic voices. Um, it can create fear. And so while government plays a, an important role in leading policy and leading lawmaking in funding opportunities, um, it is important that a lot of that support be directed to organizations. Um, government can also leverage social networks and again, regional nodes to broaden the impact of civil society organizations. So essentially creating a platform for organizations working on these efforts to do what they do well, uh, because they're so often community based, they understand the population they're serving better than anybody else. Um, prioritizing sustainability, that's always a challenge. Uh, you know, depending upon uh, which government, which budget, access to resources, providing and seeding sustainability for organizations and especially youth organizations um, that may experience burnout faster than a well-scaled and well-resourced organization is creating seed funding opportunities or other opportunities for youth to organize and implement solutions. And then again, facilitation. Government is wonderful oftentimes at facilitating um, endeavors that allow stakeholders to share best practices. And again, um, that could be something as simple as regional youth conferences. It could be an online forum such as this. It can be social media and prioritizing the role of youth. Giving youth a seat at the table is very crucial to creating challenge, to creating solutions to a challenge that we know will only worsen as technology advances and becomes more sophisticated. And as uh, individual trust in government, individual trust in content platforms uh, continues to erode. And we just wanted to showcase very quickly two examples of curriculum that we've created. Um, the first was specifically designed for girls and women around election security. Um, again, all of this work is trauma informed, which is a relatively new series of frameworks to guide educational initiatives that uh, keep in mind the idea that the populations using this type of curriculum may have experienced trauma. And so uh, trauma informed uh, frameworks can be very helpful in helping guide how one describes the threat. Um, it can be helpful in guiding interactive exercises. Um, and for folks who are listening, I'd be happy to provide more information and resources to support your learning on trauma-informed approaches if this is of interest. So this was specifically designed for girls and gender minorities within the United States. Uh, the next campaign, uh, we partnered with UN Women um, and a or wonderful organization based in the UK called Ridgeway. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Emily, I'll just touch on that briefly. So this was uh, specifically designed for adolescents throughout East Asia. Um, again, the tenor and the narrative around disinformation was slightly different. We focused um, primarily on digital security uh, risks regarding human trafficking and at the intersection of mis, dis, and malinformation. Um, this was an effective model in the sense that it provided youth activists across regions with learning tools that then they could use to both self-educate and educate their peers and communities. So again, a young person is seeing someone who looks like them talking about an issue that impacts them. And that person, especially if it's an adolescent, can speak authentically to the challenges that they are seeing on the ground in their homes, communities, and schools as well if they attend. Hope you're muted. You're muted, Amelia. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so on the slide, we just wanted to briefly touch on what we think could be some best practices to kind of mobilize you to combat MDM globally, no matter where you are. Um, for example, each country having a media li media literacy curriculum modeled after the Finnish digital literacy curriculum it is very comprehensive and it does an amazing job at really addressing key and critical points um, within their educa education atmosphere to kind of promote um, digital awareness, um, cyber hygiene, and things like that. Secondly, creation of a youth advisory council at the local, state, and federal levels. This is just so um, 
each community has a way of really kind of addressing the community's needs. You know, it can be more individualized and more specific. Um, next, establishing youth ambassadors at the local level to kind of tailor the curriculum around the community's needs and embed a media literacy curriculum. This kind of built off the, um, that previous point where, you know, each community is different and each community is impacted by MDM in a different way. So having youth ambassadors within the local community to kind of address the community's needs is super, super important. Um, identify curriculum in the community that already exists and use it to like effectively teach digital citizen, digital citizenship. So it's kind of identifying um, what you have and what you don't have within that community and um, basing basing off of that, you know, creating a curriculum around that. And then supporting local journalism and grassroots organizations. Media Literacy is um, Media Literacy Now is a great organization, and they really kind of mobilize communities within different states and kind of you know give them the resources and like a toolkit to advocate for media literacy education and get it implemented um, you know within their state legislature. Legislature. So and supporting local journalism can kind of create like an independent um, news framework. You know that um, is. That is more, I guess, that supports just local news in general. And then create and support legislation that amplifies the role of youth through cyber hygiene and media literacy skills. This is basically um, a point that kind of summarizes all of this. And it's like creating policy that really teaches youth and future generations like critical cyber hygiene and critical media, li media literacy skills. Um, Lauren, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, you know, sometimes these can all seem like massive efforts to consider designing new curriculum or new learning, but at the heart of what we're talking about is really critical thinking and self trust so building youth's trust in their ability to analyze information and so um, a basic approach that we take at Girl Security is simply acknowledging the skill sets that youth already bring to the table, um, especially for girls and women who exist in security environments in which they oftentimes have threats to their personal security. They're already very good at assessing security risks. They're already very good at critical thinking within different environments and certainly online. And so I don't think that these things necessarily have to be overly complex. They can draw on the skills that youth already bring to the table, but there does need to be cohesion across countries, across grassroots organizations supported by government, and certainly um, you know, for government to provide resources to enable these types of efforts to grow and be scalable. All right, so here we're gonna briefly talk about gendered and from gendered MDM and how it can kind of perpetuate like a systemic information cycle that really targets women and undermines their credibility. Um, we've seen this globally and we were seeing the rise of it as well. And this is resulting in barriers for women who want to enter this field. You know, the gender disinformation campaigns have, re have resulted in online and physical violence and have eroded democracy by kind of pushing women out of the arena, which is kind of the goal. For example, Russia's gender disinformation campaign to kind of discredit the Bel Belarusian opposition was was really effective. And this idea kind of painted, you know, this politician as a puppet of Western of Western countries and kind of against, you know, um, traditional Eastern European ideals. And it was really effective because this resulted in her receiving um, online violence and physical violence, you know, and it eventually like pushed her out of the arena. Lauren, if you want to add anything. I was just going to add that I think, you know, it's been um, well established, especially today that uh, women political leaders, women journalists, will be increasingly targeted by these types of efforts, which again, as Amelia noted, have resulted in and will continue to result in physical violence against them. Um, I think this also happens as well across the board uh, with women leaders and in other industry uh, in the civil society as well. And I think, 
you know, there's several different types of interventions that the field is considering, some of which includes technology platforms to flag mis, dis, and malinformation for users. Um, this falls within the, you know, trust and safety arena of content moderation. But ultimately, um, as is often the case, girls and women, we cannot wait for solutions that may take time when individual, may take a lot of time, when individual lives are being impacted every day around the world by this type of threat. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like us to answer um, in the chat or unmute yourself if possible? Yes, I actually think Lauren might be better suited to answer this question. I would pass it off to her. So was the question, if Caleb, would you mind just restating it? Was the question, um, what is happening on a global scale around this issue? Or was it specific to the American Latino population? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, during the 2016 election, there were several studies that showed that the Latino population in the United States was actually um, more susceptible to spreading mis and disinformation or more susceptible to disinformation narratives. Um, and of course that was because um, extremist groups and other online communities were again, weaponizing the Latino experience within the United States conjure that type of discord and response um, and in certain communities it actually activated um, you know physical gatherings and so i think in response to that um, that realization there's been far more dedicated efforts targeted in those communities and in, in primarily latino communities across the united states um, to specifically not just even educate youth but educate adults and seniors around how mis and disinformation are being used to weaponize those narratives and i would say those are broadly um, public education campaigns um, and initiatives coming through community-based organizations and schools. Um, but I, but I would note that uh, again, we're I think we're just at the beginning of this. Um, I think this work taking root as it must in diverse communities, as you wisely noted, um, is something that we need to commit a lot of time and resources to, um, because. Uh, the the content platforms uh, continue to struggle with not only flagging and identifying mis and dis and malinformation, but also just navigating racism online um, and gender discrimination online. And so I would say there are signs of hope. I think we're just at the beginning. 
Um, and I think there's a lot more we can do to root this work. Uh, and as you noted, uh, the use of mobile phones and mobile connections, that is also common in a lot of communities across the United States where they may not have internet access or at least steady internet access, but they have mobile phones. And so um, there are some interesting interventions happening, mostly through apps um, that mobile phones can access that allow, again, the flagging of dis and misinformation but I'm of the thought personally that that is only a small part of the solution. We really need to understand why communities are vulnerable to these narratives and work within those communities um, to help sort of air, air those, uh, those underlying causes. Um, I, I, I don't think so. Um, Lauren, are there any more questions or anything you'd like to address? Uh, final thoughts? No, and if we can be useful at all, um, please uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I think Amelia will put our contact information in the chat. You can find us on uh, LinkedIn, certainly, if you have access to, uh, to it, but we'd be happy to provide and share any of the resources that we have with anybody who may find them of use uh, in your own work. Um, uh, thank you so much for giving us a space to really talk about this issue. Um, I'm really grateful to kind of be here and kind of share our thoughts and engage in this dialogue. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. Thank you, Caleb.